على حب رسول الله الثالثة بأعلى أعلى أصواتكم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمنين ومؤمنة يا ليتنا فيا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما قال تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها النبي قل لأزواجك وبناتك ونساء المؤمنين يدنين عليهن من جلابيبهن ذلك أدنى أن يعرفن فلا يؤذين صدق الله العلي العظيم صل على محمد وآل محمد Respected elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته After Adam and Eve ate from the forbidden tree, the Holy Quran tells us that after eating from the forbidden tree in that paradisal garden, their nakedness was exposed. Immediately after eating from that forbidden tree, something was activated within Adam and Eve. What they were oblivious to before became apparent to them. They recognized that they were uncovered. They recognized their own nakedness. They were not told, you're naked. They recognized it. They felt it. They felt exposed. According to the Quranic narrative, Adam and Eve began covering themselves from Waraq al Jannah. They started to cover their nakedness with the leaves that were in that garden. According to the Quranic narrative, modesty, haya, is something that we all recognize through our fitrah. It's not something that needs to be taught. We all recognized, it is deeply ingrained within each and every one of us, 
that modesty is something that is good. Modesty is praiseworthy. And indecency is blameworthy. This is why throughout human history, when people wanted to attack each other, especially the opposite gender, oftentimes the insults are insults that target the modesty and the chastity of a person. We know through our fitra that modesty is a noble trait. We don't need revelation to tell us to be modest. This is something that is embedded in our fitrah. But what we do need is guidance on the specifics of what modesty looks like. Subhanallah, even when it comes to the existence of Allah, we have this intuitive recognition that God exists. We don't need religion to tell us that. We already have this inclination towards a higher power. And that fitra often manifests itself when we experience crisis and grief. Because we're often distracted by our own, by our environment. We're alienated from our nature. So we don't need revelation to tell us that God exists. We recognize this intuitively. This is why the Quran does not delve into detail about proving the existence of God. Maybe a handful of verses. The Quran focuses primarily on the problem of shirk. Because Allah Azza wa Jal treats His existence as a self-evident reality. Similarly, so we know that God exists. We need revelation to show us how to appreciate and honor and show reverence to His existence. We recognize that we have a creator and we're surrounded by all these blessings. And we know that it is good to thank a benefactor. We know that in our fitrah, that when good is done to you, you should express, express gratitude. But how do we express gratitude to Allah? Revelation shows you the form. It shows you the form. This is the job of the prophets. The prophets, yes, they help you become more attuned with your fitrah. Their job is to show you the form. Similarly, when it comes to the issue of modesty, we know that this is something that is good. But the question is, who decides what modesty looks like? If you argue that society should decide that, the problem is society changes. Changes quite rapidly. What was modest in the 1950s, What is modest today might have been immodest in the 1950s and the 1960s. So if you're going to leave the judgment of what constitutes modesty that is acceptable by divine standards, if you leave it to the people, if you leave it to society, what do you do if you find yourself in a nudist society? Because we know human beings can take you to some very undesirable places. Tonight, my dear brothers and sisters, I'd like to examine the topic of hijab. And let me address the elephant in the room. Subhanallah, these days we have a lot of elephants. We have an elephant, we have a giraffe, we have, we have Jurassic Park. We have a lot of issues that we have to address. 
I know for a fact that the moment the brother mentioned the topic, the moment I said I'm going to address the issue of hijab and female covering in the Quran, <clears throat> you don't need to tell me what the response is. I know what the response is. The typical response is what? Here we go again. Another man telling women what to wear. Am I right? Another man who's going to tell women what to wear. In fact, especially last night, after the lecture, people post interesting things on social media. How dare you speak about women's issues? You're not a woman. You're not a woman. My dear brothers and sisters, let us be rational for a moment. To say to someone that you are a man and therefore you have no right to speak about women's issues is essentially the implication is what? That in order to speak about any issue, you have to belong to that group. Based on that logic, no Muslim should speak about Christianity. You're not a Christian. How dare you speak about Christianity? Are you a communist? I'm not a communist. How dare you speak about communism? My dear brothers and sisters, I know where that frustration is coming from. And I'm not going to pretend that brothers have not done a lot of damage in this area. We have to be honest. That reaction has an explanation. And I understand that frustration. And I sympathize with sisters who feel that way. Because I can guarantee you they probably had a conversation with another male about hijab and that male, that man, either did not have adequate knowledge or even if they had adequate knowledge, maybe they did not have good akhlaq and maybe they didn't have wisdom. So I understand that a lot of damage has been done. But it's important for us to understand a very important reality. And that is, gender is not a qualification. It's not a qualification. Just because you are a woman, doesn't mean that you are automatically qualified to give religious rulings on women's issues. Just because you are a man doesn't mean that you're qualified to give religious rulings on issues related to men. Because gender is not a credential. Today we act as though it's a credential. I am a man and therefore I am entitled to an opinion. No, you're not. Because Islam is a specialization. What makes you qualified is knowledge, is knowledge. Whether that knowledge comes from a man or a woman. If a woman were to speak about issues related to men and she has knowledge, no man should silence her. But similarly, if a man has knowledge, and wants to address an issue related to women, he should not be silenced because he's a man. That's not going to be tolerated. Not because we want to be stubborn, because that's not the way of the Prophet. Do we have a better role model than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Because if that was the ideal, Whenever there was an issue about women, the Prophet should have put Khadija forward, say the Fatima forward. But he didn't. Sometimes men speak about 
women's issues. Sometimes women speak about men's issues. We live on, we don't live in different planets. We have, we influence each other. That's something to keep in mind. And sometimes you get this criticism. Another lecture about hijab. Why don't you give a lecture? I literally had people message me. After yesterday's lecture, Shaykh, when are you going to address the men? Baba, the first lecture was about men. That tells me that people don't listen to lectures. They read the title and they want to comment. Why don't you... How come more Shaykhs don't speak about issues related to men? We do. Scholars have written books on these subjects. The problem is people don't read a hadith. They read Instagram. It's not my problem you don't read. It's not my problem that you don't listen to lectures and take classes. People are busy watching one minute TikTok videos. It's there. Have you looked for it? Before attacking scholars for not doing enough, we ha all have taqseer. I'm the first one to admit that I have shortcomings. But let's be fair, brothers and sisters. We have to be fair. We shouldn't be irrational. Because it's very dangerous if we create this culture of silencing, as I said. Because if we silence people, if we intimidate people, if we try to cancel people, subhanAllah, everybody is waiting to cancel somebody. But you want Allah to overlook your flaws. Imagine Allah canceled you the way that you seek to cancel others. Imagine that. Let's have a little bit of rahmah. Let's have a little bit of husnudhlan. Why do we have such a negative attitude? We have to have humility. Ultimately, it doesn't matter whether the message is coming from a man or a woman. What matters is what is the argument? Does this person have knowledge? Do they have taqwa? That's the standard. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The reason why I want to bring this discussion up is because with these, these waves of Islamic feminism, Muslims who identify as progressives, as liberals, they have sought to reinterpret certain verses in the Qur'an relating to the hijab. And basically arguing that, listen, maybe the hijab is not really an obligation. Let us reimagine, let us revisit these ayat to see, have we been victims of patriarchal interpretations? Our response is, Bismillah, let us go back. But let's go back objectively. So let us see, my dear brothers and sisters, because it's becoming very dangerous, this removing the hijab culture that we see among social media influencers. It's causing a lot of brothers and sisters to ask, is the hijab a religious obligation? And if it is a religious obligation, maybe it was just addressing something in the past and it no longer has any modern day application. I think these are fair questions. But if you're never going to allow a man to ever speak about hijab, how are we supposed to discuss these issues? So, I want you all, my dear brothers and sisters, and you are my dear brothers and sisters, I don't say this as a formality, I care and I love every one of you for the sake of Allah and I love all of you because you guys are all the lovers of Imam al Hussein. And we want to make a sincere effort to know what Allah wants from us. That's it. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So I was watching not TikTok, I was watching a YouTube video a while back. I don't remember what the title of the YouTube video was, but it was about hijab in the Qur'an. So, 
I was really interested. Okay, what is this about? Click. TED Talks are about 15, 20 minutes. The woman who was presenting, she wasn't wearing hijab. So she wanted to argue she had an audience. And I'm trying not to laugh because I want to be respectful. But sometimes you don't know whether to laugh or to cry. She was speaking to the audience and she was saying that she wanted to speak about the hijab. So she said to her audience, have you ever heard of the hijab? And many of them were non-Muslims. Like, yeah, yeah, we've heard of the hijab. Okay. She's like, did you know that the verse of hijab has nothing to do with the covering of women. It has nothing to do with it. It's a verse, and she, sa- she shared Surah Al Ahzab, Surah 33, verse 53. The verse of hijab. وَإِذَا سَأَلْتُمُوهُنَّ مَتَاعًا فَاسْأَلُوهُنَّ مِنْ وَرَاءِ حجاب. This verse is about the wives of the Prophet, and Allah is commanding the believers. That if you want to ask them something, ask them from behind a screen, behind a hijab. Because that is more pure for your hearts and for their hearts. Subhanallah, what a great dalil. She says, so this is the argument. This verse has nothing to do with the hijab. And therefore the hijab is not wajib, brothers and sisters. Honestly, is this, is this a scholarly argument? <clears throat> because, the, the, because the word hijab is mentioned in this verse, in a context that has nothing to do with the female dress code, the conclusion is there is no hijab? This is, this is ridiculous. That's not how you formulate an argument. Anyone who makes this argument, you can't even take it seriously. It doesn't even warrant a response. When you look at the Quran and you look at the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt, classical Arabic, the ancient Arabs did not use the word hijab to refer to female covering. The word that was used in ancient Arabic there are a number of words. Jilbab, khimar, asitr. Sometimes the imams use the word concealment. These are the words. So if you're looking for hijab, which is a colloquial term, and you're scanning the Quran, where is the verse about hijab? You do a phonetic search, hijab. You get two verses about hijab between salt water and fresh water, and a hijab which is a screen if you want to talk to the wives of the Prophet and you say, Alhamdulillah, hijab is not wajib. Seriously? That's the argument? So that's, so ayatul hijab actually doesn't have anything to do with female covering. We have to go to another ayah, which is known as ayatul jilbab. The verse of the Jilbab, which is Surah Al Ahzab, Surah 33, verse 59. Ya ayyuhan Nabi, Qul. So the, Allah is telling the Prophet, I want you to convey this message to three groups of people. Ya ayyuhan Nabi, Qul li azwajik, wa banatik. وَنِسَاءِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Ya Rasulullah, say to your wives, your daughters, and the believing women. So now, this is not just about the wives. This is about all female believers. And this is Allah speaking through the Prophet. This is your Creator. What, is, what does the ayah say? 
يدنين عليهن من جلابيبهن command them to draw close to themselves to draw their jilbab jilbab to draw their jilbab now <clears throat> what's interesting here is that the ayah doesn't say tell the believing women to wear the jilbab the command is to do what to draw the jilbab to draw it and the implication is what they were already wearing the jilbab so Allah never needed there was no need to say wear the jilbab they were already wearing it it's like you just prayed Salatul Fajr and I say pray Fajr you already you're already doing it they're already wearing the jilbab now what is the meaning of jilbab if you refer to the classical dictionaries if you look at its usage in the pre-islamic era the jilbab is a thawb al it is a loose outer garment this is why our fuqaha they say tight clothing is not fully compliant with allah's command because jilbab means loose. It covers the shape of the female body. This is the implication, the meaning of jilbab. Yudnina alayhinna min jalabi bihin. Thalika adna an Here, Allah explains why He wants the women. To draw the jilbab. He says, because it is likelier that you will be recognized. It's likelier that you will be recognized and not harassed. Now, when you look at this verse, What's interesting is progressive scholars, and by progressive scholars, I mean the reformists. I don't even like the word progressive because it implies progress. Sometimes I think it's regressive. They argue that Jilbab was legislated so that free women would be recognized and distinguished from slave women, from female slaves. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, in Arabia, female slaves were often the ones who were sexually harassed. Because they don't have the protection of a tribe. No one messes with a free woman. But female slaves, because they are disadvantaged, because they are vulnerable, what happens? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Can the owner of a Toyota please move? It's always a Toyota, subhanallah. Subhanallah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. In Arabia, what you find, they got the message. Just take the thing off. They got the message. Toyota, whoever has a Toyota, go. Go reclaim your prize. In Arabia, female slaves were often sexually exploited. In fact, they were the ones who were prostituted. They were the ones who were sent to those red flag districts, as we would call them. So the progressive interpreters, they say that ذَلِكَ أَدْنَى أَنْ يُعْرَفْ That Allah is legislating jilbab so you can be recognized as a free woman and not, and you're distinguished. So people don't think that you're a slave and sexually harass you. 
This is the argument. And the argument, therefore, is what? Since this system doesn't exist today, there is no need for this distinction between free women and slave women. Therefore, jilbab is no longer applic applicable to modern times. That's the argument. Now, the problem with that interpretation, my dear brothers and sisters, is the following. Number one, they are arguing that the command for jilbab is only directed towards free women. Because free women were held in higher regard, they were protected. So they say this command is only for free women. But when you study usul al-fiqh, when you study Islamic legal theory, what is your justification for limiting and constricting and restricting a general command? Allah is addressing the believing women. General. You want to specify. Why do you want to specify? What is your evidence for specification? That's number one. The ayah is am. It's general. Number two. As we mentioned, Jilbab was already worn in the pre-Islamic era. There was no need for them, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to tell the women to wear it. We agree with that. And this implies what? There is no need for Allah to tell believing women to cover up so free women can be distinguished from slaves. The distinction was already there. It was already there. Free women already were wearing the jilbab. Slave women were not wearing it. Why would Allah say wear it so you can be distinguished? They are already distinguished. Why would Allah legislate something that's already, be, been, it's already been achieved in society? They've already been distinguished. They also turn to, and another point that's important to note here is that it's a very strange interpretation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to address a very damaging social ill. Slave girls are being sexually harassed. According to this liberal interpretation, Allah is essentially saying to Muslim women, cover up so you don't get sexually assaulted like the slave girls. Solve the issue. Solve the problem. Allah is just going to intervene by saying, just make sure you don't look like them. That's very implausible. There are some who cite a narration about Sabab al Nuzul. They say we have a narration that explains why this ayah was revealed. And they say that there were a group of women who came to the Prophet. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, on our way to Salatul Jama'ah, a group of men were harassing us. They were harassing us. The Prophet says, where are the men? Where are the, the men who were harassing you? Bring them. So the Prophet rebuked the men and said, why did you harass these ladies? According to this narration, the men responded by saying, we didn't know that they were free women. We thought they were slaves. And this narration, based on this narration, Allah revealed this verse to make a clear demarcation between free women and slave women. The problem is, this narration is not found in our hadith literature, number one. It's not found in the Shia hadith corpus, number one. Number two, even based on Sunni Rijal, it's a weak tradition. The foremost Rijali scholar in the Sunni tradition, Al-Albani, says this is a weak hadith. 
So what is a more plausible interpretation of the ayah? What does Allah mean when He says, Wear the jilbab, draw it over yourself. Because you are likelier to be recognized and not harassed. And it's very interesting that Allah uses likelier. It's not a guarantee. You are likelier to be recognized. Recognized for what? Sometimes the Qur'an is intentionally vague. Some verses in the Qur'an are muhkam, clear-cut. Other verses in the Qur'an are unclear, mutashabih. Allah intentionally makes it ambiguous. Why? To force you to go to the Prophet, number one. Because Allah never wants you to feel that you are independent from Rasulullah's guidance. Number two, Allah wants to test the sincerity of your heart. Are you going to take advantage of the ambiguity and interpret it in a way that conforms to your own whims? Or are you going to go look for the real interpretation? The narrations, the ulama, they say the ayah means wear the jilbab, draw the jilbab so you are likelier to be recognized for your chastity, for your modesty. And you're less likely to be harassed. Now you look at the, the Quranic wording. Allah doesn't say for sure you will never be harassed. You might be wearing the jilbab, you might be following the hijab, and some guy who has a sickness, a disease in his heart, he might harass you. But Allah says, it is likelier that you will be recognized for your chastity and not harassed. And I think that we understand this intuitively. There is a very big difference between the two. It's less likely now, we go to the next ayah, Surah An-Nur, verse 31. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so that was ayatul jilbab. This is ayatul khimar, the verse of the khimar. وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغْضُضْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنْ And tell the believing women to lower their gaze. It's interesting that we always associate lowering the gaze with the brothers. And the brothers, unfortunately, they don't do a very good job. The command is for them. But the command, interestingly, is also for the women. This means that Allah recognizes, Allah acknowledges that even a woman, a woman could look at a man with lust. That's why the modesty of the eyes is also applicable to the ladies. So in order to create a modest society, Men have to lower their gaze, and Allah begins with the men. Women have to lower their gaze as well. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He highlights that that's not enough. Yes, men need to dress modestly, but the standard for modest dress between men and women is different. Why? Because men and women are different. We are different in our psychology. And we spoke about these differences yesterday. They're different. And Islam is going to legislate based on those real differences. Women do not understand the male brain. And men don't understand the female brain. This is why we need revelation to guide us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in addition to lowering the gaze, what? وَيَحْفَظْنَ فُرُوجَهُنَّ To guard their private parts. وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا The Qur'an says, and 
they should not reveal, display their zina, their adornment, except what is revealed in and of itself. Illa ma zahara minha, except what is naturally exposed. Now, here again, it's vague, it's ambiguous. Who decides what is naturally exposed? Allah in the Quran, what does he say again? Allah intent Allah could have just made it very clear. But there is an intentional ambiguity again to test. Are you gonna follow your desires or are you gonna seek guidance from Allah? Are you gonna follow what you want? Or are you gonna seek what Allah wants from you? And then so the question now is, what is zina? What is adornment? The Quran is very clear. They should not display their zina, their adornment, except what is naturally exposed. If you go to Al-Kafi, which is the most authentic and reputable hadith source in the Shi'i tradition, there is an entire section titled, ما يحل النظر إليه من المرأة What is permissible for you to see from a woman. The narration is from Al-Fudayl ibn Yasar. He asks Imam al-Sadiq. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi. Qal sa'altu Aba Abdullah. I asked Imam al-Sadiq. Ani al-dhira'ayn min al-mar'a. He asked about the forearms of a woman. You know, sometimes the forearm is exposed. So he's asking Imam al-Sadiq, أَهُمَا مِنَ الزِّينَةُ الَّتِي قَالَ اللَّهُ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَلَ عَنْهَا Is the forearm of a woman part of that adornment that Allah is speaking about that needs to be covered? The Imam alayhi salam, he says, Naam. Imam al Sadiq. We call ourselves Ja'fari. Ja'far al Sadiq is saying the forearm is part of Zina. Now the sisters are probably thinking, men are so weird. There's nothing attractive about my forearm. Yes, sisters, men are weird. I'm sorry to break it to you. Men are strange. They find everything about you attractive. And this is how Allah created them. Imam al-Sadiq says, yes, it is from the zina. We also have other narrations. So the Imam alayhi salam, he continues, he says, Naam, wa ma dun al-khimar. So the forearm, yes, that's part of the zina that needs to be covered. And what is beneath the khimar? The khimar in classical Arabic refers to the headscarf. What is covering the hair? The Imam says, what is under the khimar, meaning the hair, is zina. What is under the khimar? The, the neck, the hair. وَمَا دُونَ السِّوَارَيْنَ And whatever is beneath the bracelets, meaning from the wrist and above, is zina. This is what is considered zina. The face and the hands, based on these narrations, they are what is allowed to be displayed. We have narrations that mention a woman could wear a bracelet, she could wear a ring, but beyond that, it needs to be concealed. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلْيَضْرِبْنَا After the prohibition of zina, in front of non-mahram men, Allah says, وَلْيَضْرِبْنَا This lam is lam al-amr. It's a command. And draw your khumur. وَلْيَضْرِبْنَا بِخُمُرِهِنَّ Again, draw your khumur. They're already wearing it. Draw it. Because they would take, they would wear the jilbab and they would let it flow. The khimar is covering their hair and the two loose ends would be around the neck. So the neck would be around the shoulders. 
the neck would be exposed, sometimes the upper part of the chest would be exposed. So Allah is saying, take the jilbab that you're already wearing and the khimar that you're already wearing and draw it over. So it covers your neck and your chest. وَلِيَضْرِبْنَا بِخُمُرِهِنَّ عَلَىٰ جِيُوبِهِنَّ and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of the at the end of the ayah, again going back to Zina, Wala Yubdina Zina Tahunna illa libuulatihin. And Allah Allah says, and do not show, do not display your adornment except in front of your your husbands and your uncles. And Allah gives a list of those who are allowed to see that adornment. Now look at how backward society is today. Society teaches, because we've created this impossible standard of beauty that has made our sisters, our wives, our daughters feel so insecure because secular societies have created this impossible standard of beauty that they feel so self-conscious to go out in the world unless they wear makeup. This is what society has done. It's damaged the self-esteem of so many of our sisters because of these fake standards of beauty. Islam says what? I want you to cover your physical beauty. I want you to cover your physical beauty because your physical beauty is a gift that I gave you to be displayed in a very intimate context. I don't want you to be exploited by society. I don't want society to define you by your physical beauty. Because we know how damaging that can be. Allah says, I'm going to cover, I want you to cover your physical beauty so people see your real beauty. So people see your real beauty. And the real beauty of a human being is what? Your intellect. Your character. I want to cover your physical beauty so it doesn't distract the world from something more beautiful. Which is your mind, your intellect, your spiritual beauty, your character. Your physical beauty will be exploited. Ex exploited if you take it to the public spheres. It is reserved for your husbands. It's reserved for your mahrams. We live in the world today, the world that we live in, men and women will adorn themselves for society, but they will not adorn themselves for each other. We'll look our best for Instagram but we won't look our best for our husbands. Same thing goes for the brothers. You'll make sure you get that fresh fade. You'll make sure that you're groomed when you go out. But your wife, when you come home, you look like a homeless guy. The point here, my dear brothers and sisters, is that Islam wanted this beauty to mean something. To be something sacred, something intimate. Are you guys tired? Can I continue? Like you had a choice. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I want to share an excerpt from a paper that was written by, let's call, I don't want to name anybody, a progressive Muslim who argues that the hijab is no longer required. They write, if the sharia's purpose for mandatory hijab was to create a Muslim dress code or to safeguard society from sexual evils, then it would have ordained it for all women within the Islamic empire in a specific manner. The argument here is, they argue that the Prophet did not compel Christian women to cover up. In our fiqh, 
female slaves don't have to cover. It's mustahab for them to cover, but they're not required. These are some of the exceptions. What you see here is that this person is assuming that the only reason why Allah legislated hijab for women is to protect them from men, to protect them from this sexual harassment. This is what the liberal would argue, the progressive would argue. The problem is, how do you know that is the only reason why Allah legislated hijab? How do you know? I'll give you a very simple example to illustrate what I mean. I'm not wearing a ring on my right hand. Does everybody see? I'm not wearing a ring. All you know is that I'm not wearing a ring. Why am I not wearing a ring? Brother, why am I not wearing a ring? He's humble. He said, I don't know. Unless you ask me, you don't really know why. Maybe I forgot it in the hotel room. Maybe I lost it. Maybe I just don't have one. Maybe I have a skin condition where if I wear metal, I'll get a rash. Maybe I don't believe that it's mustahab. So many reasons. The only way for you to know would be for, to ask me and for me to tell you. Unless Allah, His Messenger, or the Imams of Ahlul Bayt tell us specifically, this is why Allah has legislated this law, it's speculation. We don't know. Because if the only reason why Allah legislated hijab is, for, is because of men, why is it that when a woman is standing alone in her room for prayer, she still has to wear hijab? A woman is alone, nobody home, door is locked. She's by herself. She stands for salah. You would expect that if there's any moment for a woman to take off the hijab, it would be there. Allah says, no, wear the hijab. At the very least, this reveals what? Maybe there is another wisdom behind it. Now, another verse. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. We're almost finished. We haven't gotten to the climax yet. Surah An Nur, 20, Surah 24, verse 60. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالْقَوَاعِدُ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ اللَّاتِ لَا يَرْجُونَ نِكَاحًا فَلَيْسَ عَلَيْهِنَّ جُنَاحٌ أَنْ يَضَعْنَ ثِيَابَهُنْ غَيْرَ مُتَبَرِّجَاتٍ Allah says, and elderly women who have no desire or hope in marriage there is no blame upon them if they put aside their garments. What's interesting here is, someone asks Imam al-Sadiq, He asks Imam al-Sadiq, what is the meaning of garments? Imam al-Sadiq says it refers to the khimar and the jilbab. An elderly woman can remove her hijab and her khimar. Now what is an elderly woman? Of course, I would not recommend you having this conversation with sisters, brothers especially. You let them decide if they're old. An elderly woman that is not sought out for marriage. Usually 70, 80. Now, with all due respect, if you've got married at 70, props to you. An elderly woman who is not sought out, Allah says, there is no blame upon you if you put aside your garments. Number one, the fact that Allah says there is no blame means that hijab and female covering was so well established 
that when elderly women were told that you can remove the hijab, they were uncomfortable. They felt that maybe we're doing something haram. So Allah says, there is no blame upon you. And then look at what, how the eye ends. غَيْرَ متبرجات. Put aside your hijab, but don't adorn yourself. If Allah is telling a 70, 80, 90 year old woman and the verse calls them qawaid, they're sitting at home, they're old. Allah is telling such a woman that you can take off your hijab and your khimar but do not beautify yourself in front of non-mahram. If an old woman, according to the Quran, is not allowed to wear makeup in front of non-mahram, a 20, 30, 40 year old is allowed to? I know this is a very bitter truth, but this is the Quran. This is the Quran. And by the way, I put a lot of blame on the brothers, and allow me to speak freely for a moment. The problem with a lot of these religious brothers is, they talk about hijab, but they encourage tabarruj online. Hadith, religious guy, when sisters post pictures that go against the sharia, they're the first ones to like it. You are contributing to this. Because when they get that attention, when they get that approval, you're encouraging it further. You're part of the problem. You're part of the problem. We have this double standard. On the one hand, you talk religion, but on the other hand, you're liking every girl's photo on social media. And the girls, that's, they, 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 they don't only follow you. They look to see what you like as well. I was born in the U.S. I know how it works. I didn't live under a rock. That's how it works. So you're sending mixed messages. On the one hand, you're religious. But on the other hand, you're liking all of these inappropriate photos. You see, it takes both of us to create a society that has haya. It takes two of us. And I'll conclude with this verse. I hope I didn't go over my time, but I think that this is a very important discussion. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Surah An-Nur, verse 31. وَلَا يَضْرِبْنَا بِأَرْجُلِهِنَّ لِيُعْلَمَ مَا يُخْفِينَ مِنْ زِينَتِهِنَّ there was a pre-Islamic practice among some of the women that even carried over into Islam. Some women, during the time of the Prophet, when they would see men, they would try to get the attention of the guys. So they would stomp their feet. And because they had ankle bracelets, they would do this to draw attention to their hidden adornments. What's interesting here is Allah is saying, do not stomp your feet to inform the non-mahram men of the adornment that you are hiding. Imagine what Allah would say about someone who is trying to attract the attention of men to display the outer adornment. Do you see the point here? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying this behavior is not good. Do not try to attract male attention to draw attention to your hidden adornment, let alone your open adornment, your unhidden, your displayed adornment. You see, brothers and sisters, these values are lost today. You read the Qur'an, and it reminds me of the hadith of the Prophet that Islam began as gharib, 
and it will go back to being gharib. It was a stranger. And it will go back to being a stranger. Islam is gharib. Because no one, it's not only that people don't follow the Quran, there's no acknowledgement that this is the ideal. This is weird. This is too strict. But this is the Islam that Imam Hussein died for. The Islam that Imam Al Hussein died for, the Quran that Imam Al Hussein died for, includes all of these ayat. The Islam that Sayyid Zainab sacrificed so much for, the abuse that she endured was to protect this Islam. We gotta go back. We need a U turn, brothers and sisters. We got to go back to the Islam of Ahlul Bayt. Because Ahlul Bayt don't want us to do rituals while we harbor and carry secular values. What's the difference between us and the people during the time of Imam Hussein? Hajj, but they don't have Islamic values. Tonight, we share the story of one of the heroes of Karbala, one of the heroes of the revolution of Imam al Hussein, Muslim ibn Aqil. This man who grew up with Imam al Hussein. They grew up together in Medina. They were cousins. Imagine Muslim ibn Aqil having cousins like Imam al Hussein, having a cousin like Imam al Hassan, having a cousin like Sayyid Zainab, surrounded by these luminous personalities. When Imam al Hussein was in Mecca, he was receiving thousands of letters from the Kufans, inviting him to come. But Imam al Hussein السلام, is not naive. He knows that these people, they don't have a very good track record with my brother and with my father. I need to verify their intentions. Is, it, is, is this just talk? Or do you really want change? So Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he sends Muslim ibn Aqil. And with Muslim ibn Aqil, he writes a letter to the people of Kufa. Saying to them, Ba'athu ilaykum akhi, Wabn ammi wa thiqati min ahli bayti. I am sending to you, O people of Kufa, my brother, my cousin, and my trustee, Muslim ibn Aqil. Imagine this personality. Imam al Hussein says he's my brother. Imam al Hussein says he is my trustee, my confidant. When Muslim ibn Aqil, he reaches Kufa, he's welcomed. Thousands, they give bay'ah to him, they give allegiance to him. They start making plans for the arrival of Imam al Hussein. News reaches Yazid and Ibn Ziyad that Hussein has sent his cousin to Kufa. They are building a rebellion against us. So Yazid sends Ibn Ziyad from Basra to Kufa. He was the governor of Basra. He gives them control over Kufa because the governor of Kufa was weak. He wanted to crack down on the Kufans. Then, 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 then things changed. Change, 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 change. Now, 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 to remain, remain, remain with Muslim ibn Aqil is dangerous. It's easy to say that I love Imam al Hussein when there's no danger, when there's nothing to sacrifice. Suddenly, it was against the law, it was an act of treason against the state to give allegiance to this rebel. 
the wife would come to her husband and say, come, don't support him. The mother would go to her son, I don't want to see you get killed. When Muslim ibn Aqil led jama'ah prayer in Masjid al-Kufa, there were thousands behind him. When they started to apprehend and arrest, when there was the threat of execution, 10,000 were imprisoned. After Salatul Maghrib, half of the masjid was empty. After Salatul Isha, a handful of people remained. And then when he reached the gate of the masjid, he was all by himself. Muslim ibn Aqil realizes that there's no more support. There's no one left. So what does he do? He doesn't know his way around Kufa. Because he grew up in Medina. He doesn't even know how to leave the city. There is a bounty on his head. He's wandering through the alleyways of Kufa. No supporter, no helper, hungry, thirsty. He gets tired and he sits at the doorstep of a house. An old woman comes out and she says to him, Oh man, oh strange man, I don't feel comfortable having a strange man sit outside of my door. Imagine how Muslim Ibn Aqil felt, this man of dignity, this man of honor. He probably wanted the earth to swallow him. For a woman to say, because she did not know him, she was afraid. I don't want people to think things about me that there is a man sitting on my doorstep. So he says, Ya Amat Allah, can I have some water? She goes back and she brings him some water. The daughter of this woman, her name was Tawa. She said to her mother, who is this man? She says, I don't know. She says, when you went to get water, I saw him crying. She gives him the water, he finishes drinking the water, but he remains sitting. She says to him that, why don't you go back to your family, go back to your wife, why are you sitting here, don't you have a family, don't you have relatives, go back to your family. قال ليس لي في هذا المصر أهل ولا عشيرة. He says I do not have any family or tribe in the city. ليس لي في هذا المصر أهل ولا عشيرة. Bawa says, who are you? What do you mean you don't have any family here? Why don't you have any family? Who are you? قال يا أمت الله أنا مسلم ابن عقيل أنا مسلم ابن عقيل خذلني أهل الكوفة I am Muslim Ibn Aqeel, I am the deputy of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. The people of Kufa have betrayed me. She says to him, you are the deputy of Imam al Hussein, the grandson of Rasulullah, come in, come in. She says, come in, come into my home. She gives him a room for him to rest. He says to her, can you give me a bowl of water? She says, why do you want a bowl of water? He says, I want to do a boot to pray in my room. 
Taw'a she had a son, brothers and sisters, who was one of the agents of the Umayyads, one of the spies of the Umayyads. There was a bounty on the head of Muslim ibn Aqil. When her son came home, he saw that his mother was acting strangely, going from one room to another until he discovered that the man that the state was looking for was in his own house. He goes and he informs the authority that the man that you're looking for is in my home. Ibn Ziyad, ya mu'mineen. He dispatches 300 soldiers to arrest Muslim ibn Aqib. One man against 300. They say to him, why 300? He's only one man. Ibn Ziyan says, these, these men are from the family of Ali ibn Abi Talib. You cannot apprehend them with one man. You need all of the manpower. They go to him, he's given his sword, he grabs his sword. Tawa'a, she encourages him, she motivates him. But how much can a man resist? against an army of 300 soldiers. They arrest Muslim ibn Aqeel. They take him to the palace of Ibn Ziyad. They take him to the palace. Imagine he's shackled up. He stands before Ibn Ziyad. Muslim ibn Aqeel, he addresses Ibn Ziyad as Ibn Marjana. One of the guards said to him, you must address Ibn Ziyad as your Amir. Muslim ibn Aqeel says, my only Amir is Ali ibn Abi Talib. My only Amir is Hussein. They say to him that we are going to execute you for what you did, for treason. Do you have any final wasiya? Do you have any final testament? He says three things. Muslim ibn Aqil says, I want you to sell my sword and saddle. I have a debt that needs to be paid. Look at the ethics, look at the morality of those who are, who are raised in the household of Al-Muhammad. He's gonna die as a shaheed, but he wants to make sure that his debts are paid. Number two, he says, I want you to give me an Islamic burial. Allahu Akbar. Imagine this man, he has to ask just for a burial. And number three, he says, I want you to send word to Imam al that he has no supporters here in Kufa. Ibn Ziyad, he gives the signal to take Muslim ibn Aqil to the head, to the roof of the palace. They take him up step by step until he reaches the top of the palace. They make him walk to the edge of the roof. Muslim ibn Aqil, he turns to his executioners. He says to them, can you allow me to pray a two rak'ah prayer? Allow me to pray my final prayer. They say to him, yes, you can pray your final prayer. He recites takbiratul ihram. He prays, he offers his final salah. When he finishes his salah, they say to him, we see that you prolonged your salah. Are you afraid of death? He said to them, Wallah, this is the shortest two rak'ah prayer that I ever offered.
The narration say that he stood up in those final moments before the sword, the blade hit his neck. He stood there looking into the horizon. He shifted his body towards Mecca. And at that moment, a few moments before the blade hit his neck, he thought about Imam al Hussein. He closed his eyes and he whispered, Assalamu alaykum, ya Abba Abdul. Assalamu alaykum, ya Abba Abdullah. عد من حيث أتيت عد من حيث أتيت فإن القوم قد غدروا بنا يا أبا عبد الله go back because these people have betrayed us they beheaded Muslim ibn Aqeel they threw his body from the top of the palace. Fa ibn Aqeel infadat kan nufus li uzmi raziyatika al fadiha bakat kadaman ya ibn Ammil Hussein. مدامع شيعتك السافحة. As Imam Al Hussein is traveling towards Kufa, he receives news that Muslim Ibn Aqil has been warned. When Imam Al Hussein read that his beloved Muslim has been killed, Imam Al Hussein he sat on the sand, and the Imam began to cry. How precious are these tears of Abu Abdullah? He begins to cry. And then what does he do? I know your hearts are bleeding, but what does Imam al Hussein do at this moment? He says to the women, Bring me the daughters of Muslim ibn Aqi. They bring Hamida, the daughter of Muslim ibn Aqi, this little girl. They say that your uncle Hussein wants to see you. She comes to her uncle Hussein. Imam al Hussein, he says to her, Come sit in my lap. Allahu Akbar. Imam al Hussein, look at how gentle Abi Abdullah is. He puts her ha his hand on her back and his hand slowly moves until he starts patting the head of Hamida. She got the signal. She looked at her uncle Hussein. She says, my uncle Hussein, why are you brushing my head the way that the orphan's head is brushed? Did something happen to my father? Imam al Hussein says, Your father has been killed. Your father has been killed. But, O oh, Hamida, O oh, Hamida, fear not, because I am your father, O oh, Hamida. 
Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam is your father. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al ali al azim. Sayyalamu alladhin zalamu ala Muhammadin ayyamun qalbiyan qalibun. Wal aqibatu lil muttaqin. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.